Good evening, everyone. My name is Tommy Ross. I'm the co-chairman of the Somerville Labor Coalition, along with my very good friend, Ed Halloran. Uh, just to let everybody know, we, uh, we are going to be filming tonight with uh, SCAT TV. Thank you very much, SCAT. Shout out to them. Make no doubt about it. Our way of life is under attack right now. The union movement is getting smaller and smaller. There are less unions in this country right now than there were 20 years ago. One of the reasons is the right is under attack. They want our pensions. They want our health care. They want to diminish our rights. All around us right now, in New Hampshire and in Rhode Island, you see legislation being filed for right to work. It's going to come here eventually. It's going to come from the right wing. It's going to come from the Republicans. Uh, we've had some difficult times with even our own de Democratic friends. But the right to work has been beat down from in, in the other states. But these people think that we shouldn't have the right to collectively bargain very important things. We shouldn't be able to bargain wages. We shouldn't be able to bargain over our pensions, over our health care. We shouldn't have the right to bargain over simple things for safety. But we do it because collectively we're stronger than them. And we need to be like that. And we need to educate our members. And that's what we're doing today, the democratic process. And thank you all for being part of it. Our members need to know who supports us, who's with us, and who's against us. And most importantly, when we finally do make a decision who we're going to go with, what we're going to do, we have to go to work. We have to make those people make sure they get elected, do our due diligence, knock on doors, send out emails, make phone calls, talk to our friends, talk to our families, and make damn sure the people that we are electing who espouse the same views and ideologies as our rank and file get elected. They're our voice. We can't go up to the State House. We can't go up to City Hall. They can't hear us, but collectively they can. And they can hear us with our representatives. So we better make damn sure that we elect the right one. And that's what we're doing here tonight. So thank you all for coming. Now I have the very distinct pleasure of introducing uh, a longtime friend of my father, and uh, I, I consider a friend of myself, one of the most popular and long-serving mayors in uh, this city, Mayor Gene Broom. Thank you. I want to congratulate the union officers for putting on this candidate's night. It's, been fa it's fantastic. I haven't seen a crowd like this in a long time, and you should do this more often. I want to thank Ed. I want to thank Ed for being so kind to invite me to say a few words regarding the relationship between the unions and the members. The thing is that we have today the unions and, this, and the elected officials. My father was a union worker. He worked as a plasterer for the city of Somerville. When he, I don't think there was unions at that time, when he decided to retire, I think his paycheck, monthly paycheck, was $175 a month. Thank God that he was living with me and we could take care of him and my mother. That's not a lot of money to live on. But at that time, I suppose it was a lot different than what you pay for expenses today. But the thing is that we have so much that we can do together. The people who do not get involved, when it comes time for election time and people start sending them notices of they want their vote, or if they get something in the mail, a brochure, or they have their doorbell ring, they start thinking. And what they think about is that heavy tax bill they're getting, that heavy water bill they're getting, or their heavy rent charge that they're getting, and if they're getting the services to compensate for all of that. And that's where the aldermen and the unions get together. In this room today, there's probably over 100 unions people are better. I personally think, and I like to call them our goodwill ambassadors for the elected officials, because they're the ones who are going to help you get elected or re-elected. 
for what they do. But I want to talk about I want to talk about the relationship that we have and what the aldermen should do to work with the with the unions so that they can at least be partners in something that they both want to do. What's best for the city as far as the elected officials are concerned? And I hope that they do that. And if they shouldn't do that, they shouldn't get elected or they shouldn't get reelected. The second thing is the union workers, what's best for the city. And the, and the union workers, for what I can see, in my own theory, and I saw things, and I'll just say a couple. When the fire department, when I had the chemical spill in the early 80s, and we had six, 13,000 gallons of phosphorus trichloride going into our sewer system, not hitting our water supply, I was scared stiff. And we worked for 24 hours to try to remedy that. And we had over 500 people go to the hospital. I had to evacuate 14,000 people. And a lot of them that went to the hospital were firemen, and some never came back to work. It's things like that. And what happens with the police? When they go out and sometimes not knowing if they're going to come back home again. And look at Oliveri, Mario Oliveri, got shot five times. And look at Sean, Sean Collier, who minded his own business, but he got shot, and he's dead today. And, and I look at the DPW workers, and you see it every day. They're planting the trees, they're cleaning the city, they're planting flowers, they, they're fixing sidewalks, they do, the, they do uh, water breaks, on and on and on. And so those of you who are ambassadors, because the all of them can say, when, they, when the people say to them, well, what am I getting for city services? I'll tell you what you're getting. And you can say all of those things. And you have something good to say about each one of, of those departments, and even the departments that you don't see. The election department, and the school department, the, the, the librarians, the people who work in all the different departments in City Hall, city clerk's office, on and on and on. And she's telling me to stop. <laughs> my, my, my assistant, Grace Abruzzo, used to do that when I used to speak, and she'd go like this, and i go like this. And, she would go, and then she'd go like this. But in any case, in any case, I will stop because I know you have a long agenda. You don't want to hear me. You want to hear the candidates. But, but most of all, I want to say this. One thing my father did say to me, and I'll stop. One thing my father did say to me when I became an alderman, I know you can't do much for the city workers as an alderman, but whatever you can do, please try to help them. They're deserving of your help. And that's why when, not when, when uh, uh, health insurance went from 50% to 99%, and it almost killed me, and then they had the unions come to me and say to me, would you give it to the retirees too? As tough as we were financially, I had to do it. I had to do it because it was right to do so. And that's what I did. So I'll stop by saying that I want to congratulate all the candidates that are running, because we'd like to have new blood. I want to wish them all luck, the candidates that are running and the ones that are running for re-election. But remember one thing. It's the voters that are going to put you in there, and you can't fool the voters. Don't, think the, don't listen to the developers. Don't look and listen to the big business. They can buy your bumper stickers, and they can get your brochures, but they can't get your votes. You're going to hear a lot of things tonight about uh, development, about transparency, about uh, affordable housing, and you know, and all this kind of stuff is important. But as municipal workers, I just want to remind all of us of what's happened in this past administration over the 10 years. We had one of the lowest paid DPW departments in the entire state compared to the other, other cities and towns. Had to go seven years almost seven years without a contract. The police office is doing one of the most dangerous jobs that anybody, over five years without a contract. The police officers, the firefighters, another four years. We can't sign contracts fairly. They're not negotiating fairly with any municipal union. And this is what brought us all together, is the frustration. Is the frustration, and now that's bringing us together collectively, and it's turned into a, a, a three-headed monster, and we're gonna make something out of it. So thank you very much for your support. I would also be remiss if I just didn't mention real quickly about some of the people that made this possible, because there's been a, a, a lot of moving parts. Eddie Halloran, right here, he gets his uh, a, a round of applause. Absolutely. 
Without Eddie, without Eddie and his inspiration, there would be no SLC, I can tell you that. Peter Blakey, thank you very much. Mike McGrath, Mike Cabral, Steve Ross, Jimmy Roderick, Terry Medeiros, all the members of the uh, SLC Executive Board, thank you very much for making this happen. And now, without further ado, I would like to uh, introduce our moderator for the night from SCAT TV, the ubiquitous uh, Joe Lynch. Welcome to the 2017 Somerville Labor Coalition Candidates Night and Forum. I am Joe Lynch, your moderator for the evening, and it is my pleasure to have been asked by the SLC to participate in tonight's event. I am a board of directors member of the Somerville Media Center, more commonly known to most of you as SCAT TV, and we are thrilled to be asked by SLC to tape tonight's forum, but before we go any further, we played a trick on all of you. We are Facebook living this event. So when Eddie and Tommy asked me, they said, should we announce it? I said, no, because they'll all stay home. So it is on the Somerville Labor Coalition's live face be, uh, Facebook feed as we speak. So, SCAT TV will be showing this tape program in the coming days. Watch for announcements in the local media and on SCAT TV's website. In the interest of full disclosure, though, I do have to reveal that I'm also the vice chair of the Ward 5 City Democratic Committee. So, let's get down to the business of tonight. As with any political forum or debate, there are some guidelines and rules that the SLC and I have agreed to follow and the candidates. First and foremost, in the event of any emergency, please take a look around the room, familiarize yourself with the emergency exits of the facility and the moderator is taken out first. <laughs> Second, we ask that all recording devices, cameras and cell phones be put on mute and that flashes to be, are held to a minimum. And third, Please get very comfortable because it's going to be a very long night. I would like to recognize, as Tommy has, the planners of tonight's event. So if the leaders of the SLC could stand and be acknowledged one more time. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Also in the room, but not participating, are some of the current elected officials here in Somerville. So I'm just gonna ask you to hold your applause. State Representative Denise Provo is here. <laughs> not participating. So we also have uh, Ward 1 Alderman, Matt McLaughlin. He's already standing, all right. Let me see, we also have Ward 5, Alderman Mark Niedegang, Ward 6, Alderman Lance Davis. We have from the Somerville School Department, we have Ward 5 and Chair of the Somerville School Committee, Laura Patone. We also have Carrie Norman, who is in attendance. We have Lee Erica Palmer in attendance. Did I miss anybody? Any current elected official? Sorry? They are participating tonight. They get their own special introduction. <laughs> Union folks, pay attention. <laughs> I'd also like to, re I, I would like to recognize somebody who all of the candidates know, whether they're gonna be up here uh, debating or chatting. We have the special pleasure of having one of the best election commissioners in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Where is Nick Salerno? Where is he? Get up. Get up, Salerno. So thank you all for coming. We also have with us declared candidates for school committee from Ward 1. As you know, the school committee will be contacted by SLC at a later point. So the school committee candidates for Ward 1 are Guillermo Samuel Hamlin. He's with us tonight. Tracy Pratt is here with us tonight and Emily Ackman. In Ward 2, we have two new entrants into the Ward 2 school committee. We have Ann Kamara 
And we have Susan McDonald Neonakis. We also have in Ward 1 a new entrant. Elio LaRusso is present in the room. Elio, down the back. And I think I got everybody there. So let me just kind of, uh, th there was some confusion about who's participating and who's not participating. So as it was explained in the emails sent out by the SLC, we also have the late entrants who will not be participating in tonight. So there was a cutoff that was established by the SLC when they sent out their questionnaire. If, they re if the candidates returned their questionnaire, then they were included for endorsement by the SLC and they would be invited to the forum. So that's how it worked. The late entrants did not get invited to participate in the forum. They will also not be considered for endorsement by the SLC. So let's get going. The forum will be broken into three different segments. First up will be the candidates for the individual wards. The eligible participants will be from Ward 2, Ward 3, and Ward 4. Next will be the two declared candidates for mayor. And we will finish up with the evening with the seven eligible candidates for four aldermen at large seats. One candidate informed the SLC this morning, late this morning, early this afternoon, that he would not be participating in the forum. We do have some questions from the audience, and if time allows, we will make every effort to include them in the candidate questions. We're on a very, very tight timetable, and I know everyone is very excited to see the candidate do well, but in order to give the maximum time for the answers, we ask all of you to hold any applause or cheering or audible displeasure <laughs> till the very end of the round. If not, I will have Mayor Jean Brune take you out into the lobby and talk to you. <laughs> and talk to you for a very long time. Once again, we are back with the final portion of the Somerville Labor Coalition Candidates Night and Forum. Um, once again, I am Joe Lynch, still here. It is my pleasure to introduce to you the candidates for Alderman at Large in the city of Somerville. We'll start with the incumbents. Incumbent Jack Conley. Incumbent Mary Jo Rossetti. Incumbent Dennis Sullivan. And incumbent Bill White, President of the Board of Aldermen. It is also my pleasure, for any of you who know me, I love challengers. It is my pleasure to introduce the Alderman at Large challengers, Stephanie Hirsch. Will Emba and Kevin Tarpley. As some of you know, there are four challengers. This morning, SLC received word from the eighth Alderman at Large candidate. He would not be attending tonight. So as with the other uh, offices, uh, the other candidates that we've spoken to, each candidate will get a two minute opening statement and we'll go right down the line alphabetically. I thought that was a fair way of doing it. And then each question will have a one minute response. If you could pay attention to my lovely assistant sitting right by the camera, she will tell you when you have 20 seconds left and she will ask you to stop. And as again, if you don't stop, I'll have former mayor Gene Brune take you out into the hall and tell you the story of his mayorship. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce incumbent Jack Conley with a two minute opening statement. Jack, you can sit. <laughs> Joe is always good telling people what to do, isn't he? <laughs> well, it's so much easier to stand because I stand for something. After uh, 20 years as a Ward Alderman in Ward 6, and now 10 years at large, I'm here because I represent not just the people of the city, but the people who truly make the city move and make it run and keep us going. I am quite pleased to say that all the years of have worked here in the city that has been working with individuals. I don't have to call a foreman, I don't have to call a supervisor. A lot of times I can let somebody know there's an issue and every time somebody responds. I'm very pleased to say I'm from a labor family. My grandfather helped you know, get the common June going. He dug subway tunnels. 
um, for the T way back at the turn of the century. My mother and father were both union members. My brother's local 17, sheet metal workers. So I know a lot about what goes on and to maintain and keep the dignity of the working person, especially here in Somerville with the affordability problem that we now have. It's not an issue that one city is going to solve, but all of us are collectively going to work, I am sure, to make sure that we solve it as a community and do our best to keep you all here. So I'm anxious and willing, very happy we have very qualified and uh, dignified people who are challenging us. You'll get the best out of all of us, I'm sure. So thank you for the opportunity Yet again. Looking forward to this evening. Thank you one and all. Thank you, Jack. <laughs> Stephanie Hirsch. Uh, so Thank you for having me. It's been a great discussion. I'm so glad you kicked off the campaign season with this event. Um, a little bit about myself. I'm from northern Wisconsin, a community in northern Wisconsin. It was a great place to grow up. It had a very strong and very large middle class. We all lived together on the same street. We played together. We went to the same schools. There were basically no private schools. My parents are both teachers. And what Everybody, from, from my perspective as a, as a 10 year old, it seemed like every adult took care of every child in that block, in that city, and every adult invested in our community institutions like the libraries and the YMCAs. There is no us and them, we are all in it together. And I took away from that experience two things. One, that we need um, a strong middle class. And what made that work in Eau Claire, Wisconsin was labor, both public and private labor unions and also in Wisconsin, the strong family-owned uh, farms were kind of a core of this middle class. And the other part of it that I took away was that we all need to be connected as a community, understand one another, and invest in each other, our children. It should always be all of us together. Uh, after college, I worked in two communities in Philadelphia and rural Georgia that were really the opposite of my hometown. It was all us and them. Um, people did not have any kind of jobs. The only jobs that existed were in Walmart, they were terrible, or there were no jobs. And also government didn't function. And I set as a life goal to figure out how you could improve government so that it would prevent really heartbreaking inefficiencies and it would make people's lives work out better. I came to Somerville and worked in the mayor's office to start Somerset and I gather from the prior <laughs> discussion that people might not be super positive about Somerset I was on the management side of collective bargaining. That said, I, I think that I will do a great job of understanding the inner workings and what to change and where to change and affordability, the opioids. And I just want to say my most important thing that I care about is community. Not ideology, not symbolism, but community. And every day, there's not a day that, doesn't, that goes by that I don't appreciate the work of your union members. On the cold days, I look at the snow plows. On the hot days, I look at Marty Pantanella and her crew hustling. The librarians who work even in really troubled facilities and the custodians who maintain them. The school nurse who sees my daughter once a week. Um, the PCOs who get yelled at all. Thanks. Thanks. Will Emba. Challenger for Alderman at Large. Thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. I want to first of all acknowledge my beautiful wife, Christelle, who is in the audience. Today, tonight is our wedding anniversary, and she allowed, you know, accepted that we should have a debate night instead of a date night. So Baby, thank you so much. I love you. <laughs> so my journey to be here tonight has been long and trying. But I will not change a detail of my story. That is simply because, you know, it has shaped me as a person and as a candidate running for Alderman. I was born and raised in Cameroon to a middle class family. And my parents passed away when I was young. So as a result of that, I spent some time in a foster home. I discovered in my journey to America that it took hard work to succeed. Yes, but it also took my community lifting me up at key moments for me to succeed and stand on this stage before you tonight. My community and my early custodial union at MIT picked me up and provided me with the help I have needed to thrive. Unions are a crucial part of our community. Unions, the way I see it, are the community. When unions win, the community wins. 
All workers are lifted up by their gains. I care deeply about affordability, community-led development, and economic fairness. And I believe these are the backbones and values of any union movement. We need a $15 living wage. We need paid medical and family leave. We need a community-led development. That is why I have not pledged to take any money from for-profit developers in my campaign and any of their associates. Because we want to protect the community and the workers that live in that community. We need more affordable housing. Thank you. Incumbent Alderman at large, Mary Jo Rossetti. Thank you, Joe. I think I'm going to take you up on your offer to stay seated. <laughs> uh, I want to first and foremost thank um, the SLC for this honor uh, of having us all here before you this evening. Um, it was a powerful showing of people who were here earlier, and I'm so pleased that it's being taped. Hopefully this will be the first of many more to follow, so thank you. Hats off to all of you for doing this for us. Um, for those of you who may not know me, I'm a lifer. My dad was raised in Somerville, and he became a, uh, he served our country, and when he came home from serving, he became a Somerville firefighter. He met my mom, who was from Roxbury, and um, the, he immediately, after 10 days, asked her to marry him. And, but the, the stipulation was that she had to move to Somerville because he loved this community. And um, so he raised, he and my mom raised me and my sister. My husband also grew up um, in Somerville. I did not know him growing up. I met him um, after school. And, we uh, continue to reside in a very happy and proud of our community, and my children are also um, in Somerville. So um, we are a family who have been so committed to this community. And what's most important to me about my dad is that he's a brother. He passed three years ago, four years ago. I actually have a piece of his uniform with me here today. But he was a member of the Local 76, the Firefighters Association. And when my dad was sick and my mom was sick and I had to use 911 a few times for services at home, I will never, ever forget. The firefighters always arrive first for whatever reason. And as they were coming up the stairway, they would notice a picture of my dad honoring his dad in a firefighter uniform and I'd hear them whisper one after the other, we've got a brother, we've got a brother, we've got a brother. Now move that ahead to my sister and I being raised and my father I I stressing on the importance of union and that he felt that although he himself couldn't be actively involved, he was very shy, very not like me, very shy, but he um, explained to my sister and I what union your membership meant and that you know the union had not only his back but his wife's back and his children's backs. And I saw that growing up, and I'm grateful to you all, and I hope I can answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Jo. Incumbent Alderman Dennis Sullivan. Good evening, everyone. Dennis Sullivan, Alderman at Lodge. You know, I've been told that I was born, baptized Catholic, but born Union. I'm a 30-year member of the Mass Correction Officers Federated Union. In fact, my first elected position was a steward with the Mass Correction Officers Federated Union. I've won the Greater Boston Labor Council Municipal Leadership Award for my strong support of families. When the school custodians were threatened with total privatization, I led the board, the board on the fight to save some of those jobs. We weren't totally successful, but we saved many, many jobs. I didn't look at those, those numbers that they were saving. They, they were saying, we're gonna save this amount of money if we privatize. I looked at it that we're gonna hurt families, hurt people that have invested their lives working for the city and, and stopped their pensions. I said no, and we were, we, were, we were somewhat successful, not totally, but I'm proud of that work. Uh, recently, we've, pa we've passed resolutions uh, supporting Verizon, uh, uh, asking Union Square to, to do a prevailing wage uh, to uh, support health care for their workers that are going to do the work down there. We did the same with Federal Realty. I visited the students at Tufts University when they were supporting Tufts janitors. I went up there, I delivered them water, offered them support several times during that struggle. Uh, and all that's great to win an award like the Boston Municip Municipal Ship Award, but locally, when a union leader in Somerville wants to talk to me regarding an issue in the city or what's going on the board, 
Peter Blakey from the school custodians picks up the phone and calls me. Tommy Ross from the fire department. Ed Halloran from the DPW. Mike McGrath from the police department. And Terry Medeiros from 911. I've built over the last 20 years a good working relationship, and I want to continue that. Lastly, I will never forget who I am. I have a three-year-old daughter. I'm married. I'm invested here. And it makes a difference who's on that horseshoe, and I will never f forget that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dennis Sullivan. Challenger, Kevin Tarpley. Thank you. Uh, thank you, members of uh, the Summer Labor Council. Uh, my name's Kevin Tarpley, and I'm an American. I'm here to run for uh, alderman at large in the interest of public service. I'm not a politician. I've served as alderman in War II uh, in 1997 until 2001. And I resigned to go work for the Kellogg Foundation uh, because there was another mission calling. And also we had a, recently had 9-11 happen and my job was eliminated to create the Homeland Security Office. Uh, I would have loved to have stayed and continue to serve here in Somerville. Uh, I'm going to take this little opportunity in terms of introduction to uh, also address uh, what I want to do as the uh, new at-large alderman. And the question that was sent to us was about uh, a moral question uh, in, in regards to uh, the, the workers. I grew up uh, in a union community, Youngstown, Ohio. I was a member of a union. Uh, one of the things I remember was when things were not so good, we always got a 3% cola. When things were going pretty good, we always got a 5% cross the board increase. And I grew to uh, believe that to be a uh, uh, honorable and respectful uh, way of doing business because then it eliminated the possibility of striking, but it also recognized that uh, people deserve that support. Uh, one of the other things that I would do, and, I, and this is what I would want to support going forward with here in Somerville, because the unions went through the pains without kicking, scratching, and fighting, I would also want to figure out how do we give those union members uh, a pay, pay them for going through it with us a signing bonus, some kind of longevity bonus, something to thank them for going through the pain with us. Thank you, Kevin. <laughs> Incumbent Alderman Bill White. Thank you all for having me. Joe, just once, can you start with the back end of the alphabet? It's always <laughs> W, I always go last after everybody's spoken, but. <laughs> Excellent, sign that guy up. Um, <laughs> One of the things they say that a person's value is formed during their youth. I grew up a few blocks away on Rossmore Street, and one of the things I remember as a youngster was when my father was talking to my mother about a strike vote that he was thinking about taking. Of course, my mother was concerned about the finances, and my father was saying, well, you know, we have to send a message, and maybe we're going to have to suffer a little bit, but I think that it's going to be a strike vote, because we got to send the message. And in fact, there was a strike vote. Yeah, they went on strike, and there was some difficult financial times for a while, but they did send a message, and they got the benefits that they were looking for. So that sent a message to me as an elected official. And I think it's incumbent upon all of us here tonight to send a message, because what I've seen in the last 20 years is a tremendous reduction in wages and earnings. They all talk about the top 1% taken over, and that's because they've put the burden on the working class, they've done away with unions, they've taken the power away from unions, and they're balancing the economy on working class and poor people's backs. So we're going to do the best we can here in Somerville to try to do what we can to right that. So I've been trying to send a message as an elected official in a number of ways. I've been an open book here for 20 years, just like all of us have, you know, we've worked with all the union leaders. We've approved numerous resolutions. I remember once we were threatened with a lawsuit because we claimed, I forget, some contractor was using shoddy equipment, et cetera, poor labor standards. We got threatened with the suit. I said, fine, sue us, because truth is a defense. And I knew we had no doubt that we could show that's just what that was contractor was going to do. I've walked picket lines as well. 
We were all responsible for passing the living wage ordinance, which I've just put an order in to make sure I think it should be at $15 an hour now. But one thing I've tried to do along with... <laughs> Thank you. I'll answer some of these when I get to the questions. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Bill. So, Bill White, I'm going to grant your wish. The first question is for you. In June of 2016, at a finance committee meeting of the BOA, they were reviewing a non-union study that resulted in non-union workers receiving a very healthy raise in both fiscal year 17 and 18. The Board of Aldermen voted and passed a resolution to show the same consideration to the SMEA and their study. What are you going to do to ensure that there is follow-up support and any progress on that resolution? Because that item should be in the Finance Committee and it should be followed up by having the Director of Personnel come forward and indicate to us what the status is of the collecting bargaining agreements. And again, some of that has to be done in executive session. And if we find that they're not moving forward in, good, in what we would view as good faith, to implement reasonable living wage increases and union benefits, then we have the power of the resolution, just as we did with the Evergreen Clause. I don't think there'd be any hesitancy upon us in expressing our, you know, a statement that we believe the, you know, the negotiation should go forward in good faith to make sure that appropriate benefits and wages are bargained for with our unions. Thank you, Bill. Why don't we just go down the line? We'll give the next one. Uh, we'll give it to Kevin. Kevin, you're gonna, if you're successful in uh, November, how would you ensure that that resolution has some teeth to it? Well, well, one of the things I would uh, push whoever becomes the board president to make sure that he's uh, pushing the chair of the finance committee to move that item out of committee. Uh, I myself, as a member, would uh, call for uh, a review of that particular item. Uh, in terms of where it, where it is at, and even uh, communicating to the, uh, to the mayor's office to have them, as Alderman White said, send your representative for it and, and uh, make the board, uh, make it known to the board where we're at. Part of the role as Alderman is you got to bug. You got to bug whatever entity, be it the mayor's office, a department, uh, or, uh, or a private contractor, you have to bug them and hold their feet account, hold their feet to the fire to hold them accountable to make sure items are moving forward. And I will do that. My record speaks to that. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. Same question, Dennis Sullivan. Uh, like like former Ward Two Alderman Kevin said that um, basically you have to keep calling them, keep bringing them in, asking where it's at, asking for updates. Uh, public forum, the union right here is doing a great job with this forum tonight. I would implore that. You know, some of the, um, the weight or the burden has to be on the union members to organize, to financially support candidates, to get out there, hold signs. Uh, and the same goes for the mayor's race. I mean, you've, you're doing a great job in this, this aspect, but I'm in, I, I ask you to take it one step further and, and, and get financially behind candidates. You know, show up at the polls. This is great tonight, but it has to continue throughout the year. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Mary Jo Rossetti. Thank you, Joe. Uh, I hate to sound like an echo here, but honestly, it is when it is in finance, it's on us to make sure that it is it is uh, brought up in finance. And if we're not happy with that e that answer, it stays in finance, and we continue to push the button. We can we can propose resolves and resolutions, but if you were following the recent budget process that just ended last week. When it was suggested to me at one point I was trying to push for, it was suggested as a reminder I could put in a resolve, or a resolve is a wish list. So we can propose as many resolutions as we want. It doesn't necessarily mean that that's what the executive office will work toward. So yes, the power is on us to push it to a higher level and how can we do that? Sitting here right now and sitting here this evening and hearing all many of the other discussions, I think it's in our power to ask for an executive session, to ask for follow-up and updates where we are in negotiation. One small problem for me since I've become an alderman is the difference in negotiation when you serve as a school committee member, and I've been told to stop, is a difference having um, involvement with negotiation as a member of the Board of Aldermen, and I hope to be able to work towards changing that. Thank you, Mary Jo. Will? Yeah, thank you. I certainly agree with uh, 
what Mary Jo and the other colleagues of mine have said, because like I stated before, I used to be uh, a service employee with the International Union 32B, you know, at MIT, and they actually have won so many gains because of being organized, you know, actually right now, like a worker, you know, as a custodian worker at MIT earns above $23 an hour. So, like we said, you know, just to get people organized and, you know, talk to your board of other men and then we can actually push the agenda forward, like having an executive session and making people accountable for the decision that they take. Thank you. Thank you, Will. <laughs> Stephanie Thank Hirsch. You. Uh, so all of that sounds great, and I want to say that I can bring an, uh, an additional skill set to the table if I am elected. I, I am the, um, the I, I created Summerstat, so I really understand the municipal data, including a lot of the data that's publicly available, like the salaries. And you can, if you have that um, ability, you can actually, you know, dig into the data and have it be a, um, a way to make a case. So you can do comparisons to other cities. Um, so like uh, having looked at the salary data, I can see that there's a really significant gap, gender gap, um, and I can get into that more later if you're interested. And you can also use some of the same tools that the city uses to, to measure its own progress. You could have like a regular report card, and once you have that information, it's a very powerful organizing tour and a tool, and it's, and it's rooted in kind of concrete, and it would be persuasive you know, to the city as well as, well as the public. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Stephanie. Jack Conley. Uh, thank you, Joe. You know, uh, it's my position that one gets elected because they work very well in black and white. I think you get reelected because you work real well in the gray areas. And having been through this situation in the past, if a situation like that arises and after going it, coming out of finance, going to executive session, we're still not where we want to be, there are going to be opportunities where the administration may fervently want an appropriation or a change. The opportunity then is to hold back and wait and use the leverage that we have at the, at, with the power of the purse. We don't have to approve everything that comes through just because it's asked for. We can delay or we cannot approve. So if we need to, we have to use that leverage. It's there. I'm always happy to do so, and I'm sure my colleagues will do the same. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. So if the candidates don't mind, I'm going to start back up here with Jack Conley. And this, this goes to something that you've all heard during, during the night. There appears to be a problem when it comes to the current mayor and his relationship with the unions. So I'm going to ask you a question. When it comes to his appointments, have any of you incumbents ever said no to any of his appointments for the planning board or the zoning board of appeals? So let's start with Jack. Joe, I, you know, I honestly, I, I, I can't recall because we're going back a long time for me. However, I can tell you, knowing the processes I do, the, the vetting that goes on prior to us getting to our level, especially involved with the police, the fire, the DPW, various positions that come forward, we look at those carefully. And it's a uh, long thought about uh, position that I've had that sometimes uh, if an administration is looking for a particular candidate, then if that person isn't appointed, then the administrator, well, you didn't give us the guy we want. However, if you give the person we want, they want and they end up screwing up, it's a lot easier to go back and say, listen, this is the guy you wanted, he or she's not doing the job. There's plenty of, I think, cases to look back on where that certainly is the case. So I think it's all in the vetting that goes on even before it gets to our level, especially with civil service, which I'm a huge proponent of. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Let's go right over to Mary Jo Rossetti. Thank you, Joe. This is a tough one for me to respond to because I recused myself from planning and zoning. Um, my husband serves on the zoning board, and he was appointed to the zoning board long before I became a member of the Board of Aldermen. And uh, he and I, actually when I was elected as a member of the board, he was going to withdraw and he, uh, the state ethics office said he had no reason that he needed to withdraw. So we both have filed papers and each time I testify before zoning, I make that statement and I have angered him many times in, in advocating for areas that he's not happy that I've gone in the direction. But I speak my truth. But I can, as for another board other than zoning or planning, there is somebody, a, a member 
who's been recommended by the administration in confirmations of appointments committee right now. And it isn't going so well because I and a couple of other of my colleagues um, were not impressed by the candidate. We did a lot of pushback and as a result, uh, the candidate's name still sits in committee and we're actually waiting for another, another name to be put forth before us. So although it's not planning or zoning, I have been privy to a uh, recent conversation where we have not approved. It's still in committee. Thank you, Mary Jo. We'll go right to Dennis Sullivan on that one. Thank you, Joe. I have not voted against the planning or a zoning board member. I have spent in the last 14 years, many nights before the planning and the zoning, uh, advocating for responsible development across the city. Like my colleague before me said, Mary Jo, that there is one on the uh, licensing commission that has been stalled. Uh, we take a hard look at them. I think planning and zoning, we spend a great amount of time before them. Uh, not, not only we just don't look at their resume, we interview them, but I'm, I'm up there probably twice a month before each of them. So I, I feel like you know, I, I have a great interview while, while they're doing their work, while I'm advocating for responsible development. So I have not, but I, I take a hard look at it every time it comes up. I am on the confirmation committee and I will continue to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Right over to Bill White. Let's see, the truth is in the 25 to 30 years that I can remember some of government, no uh, candidate for appointment to either the planning or the zoning board has ever been voted down or I don't know has, has ever received a negative vote. Um, part of it is because a lot of the development issues haven't really arisen until the last few years. So uh, usually the candidates that are presented all appear to be quite decent candidates so there's nothing in their records that would um, generally raise a red flag. Now we do have an instance that's taking place now in confirmation of appointments. So generally when that happens, the name isn't voted down, but it's withdrawn. Now where we're going to have to exercise, um, I think the extent of our discretion is when, when and if folks come up for review who have been in, and then there's questions about decisions that they may have made or philosophies that they have. And that's where the board going forward will, I believe, have to exercise its role. And it's probably going to be more in reconfirmations. Thank you, Bill. Sorry, challengers, I just, I wanted a bit them to be able to say yes or no. So let's go into a couple of questions that the union folks have submitted. This pertains to collective bargaining. Would you use your moral authority of your office to assist public and private sector unions in our community to settle collective bargaining disputes? If your answer is yes, how are you gonna do it? Let's start with Stephanie Hirsch. Uh, as, as I was saying before, I'm, I'm really like the nuts and bolts of municipal management, so really getting into the weeds. I would want to understand what the terms are that people are, 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 are disagreeing on and look if there's any way that we can find, if I could work with you to understand your needs to find more of a kind of a compromise or win-win situation. And if there isn't a win-win situation, um, and thinking about the whole pic fiscal picture of the city, I would, you know, use, you know, be as transparent as possible with the information to, to lobby the city and bring um, other people in the public to bear it. And that said, I will say in honesty, I think that the city's fiscal state is is not great. I mean, we don't have a lot of money to spend, so I think there will have to be austerity. I, that's my that's my understanding from putting the budget together for many years that there that we do have to make decisions and hard choices in the city Thank you, Stephanie will So thank you for the question I will say yes, I will support you know the for, I will support the bargaining unit for the unions just as I stated that I was you know a custodian at MIT and you know and part of my speech, I said, when union wins, the community wins too. It's like a gain for everybody. And how will I do that? Also, like Stephanie said, I will look at the budget first. That's where I will look into the budget to be able to, you know, reconcile the bargaining that they are trying to look for. Thank you. Mary Jo. Thank you for the question. Uh, recently, the police officer, the police association uh, came before, or actually, the administration came before the Board of Aldermen at a finance meeting where um, after a very long, long contentious negotiation, it 
came before us for the Board of Aldermen's vote. And who spoke before us was the council who represented the city and the mayor. And then it turned to time for the Board of Aldermen to cast their vote whether or not they would vote in favor of this contract agreement. I asked, which I didn't think was out of sorts, and I learned after that meeting that, wow, that had never been done before and a couple of jaws dropped. But before I voted, I asked that, was there somebody here from the union who would like to speak before us to let us know their thoughts on this contract that was now before us for signature that had been in negotiation for many years beyond when it should have been signed. And um, the co their counsel was there. I wasn't sure who the gentleman, one of the gentlemen in the room was. It turned out to be their counsel. He welcomed the opportunity. He uh, joined us at the table, and we heard firsthand the union's opinion. So then and only then did I agree to vote the contract. And it may have been a first, but as I said in my response to the questions asked to have us here this evening, as long as I am serving, it will not be the last time I ask for a union member to speak at the table. Thank you, Mary Jo. Dennis Sullivan. Uh, thank you, Joe. When I, when I first got elected school committee, I grew up right across the street from the Holiday Inn. I could hit it with a baseball throw. Maybe it would take me two now. But um, 20 years ago, and I was shocked at the amount of grievances that the union was putting forth to the, uh, the administration. Now, the school committee is a different relationship. We, we're, we're more of a board of directors that vote on the superintendent's um, performance. We hire, we fire the superintendent. And I advocated to settle these without going to arbitration, without costing a lot of money. And oftentimes, we don't get a good decision. The police and fire, when they're at an impasse during the contract, they go to the JLC. And they come back at oftentimes more than they would have gotten if we just bargained in good faith. So, you know, we, ha we have to keep reminding the mayor of that. You know, I will continue to do so. I've been an advocate for that. And, um, you know, I am a union member. I get it. So, thank you. Dennis. Kevin Tarpley. Thank you. Uh, one of the first things that I did as a new alderman uh, when I was serving on the war, uh, serving the war two was to call for an investigation of uh, the DPW because of treatment of gender, age, and racial discrimination. When we look at the collective bargaining piece, it's not just about the money because that's what we're focusing on. We're, it's also about how we treat our workers. The sad part was I was the only alderman that supported that investigation the call for that investigation. It was, it was shelved, it, it was not uh, allowed to go forward. And that is, to me, more than the moral piece that we're looking for. It is truly the action that I think city workers are looking for. They don't want just lip service. They want elected officials that are gonna be public servants that are gonna actually take action to protect their rights, uh, not just their pay. So uh, I, in terms of collective bargaining, I will do whatever I can to move it forward, but I, I'm willing to go beyond that in order to protect the rights of workers. Thank you, Kevin. Bill White. Well, you can go by a person's practice when there was the issue of the Evergreen Clause resolution coming before the Board of Aldermen's president. And I, didn't I said certainly come forward, supported the right of the union to come speak before the board. Um, but more than that, I mean, instances, are, this doesn't necessarily involve union, but it was civil service. I remember when there was a civil service grievance filed because of a police officer where I actually went to the Civil Service Commission, got Xerox copies of the documents to look over those documents because it was before the Confirmation of Appointments Committee, along with Alderman Gowart. She was on the board with me then, and we took a hard look at that and raised questions. So there's a practice of me as well as raising questions, and again, I think you go by a person's practice and there will be no hesitancy uh, of me of going forward in instances where there's unfairness in the dealing with collective bargaining to raise that issue and use the moral authority of the Board of Aldermen to move it forward. Thank you, Bill. We're up with Jack Conley. Uh, thank you, Joe. Uh, and as some of my colleagues have said, I don't think there's any of us here with any issues whatsoever from my point of view about making sure that the collective bargaining process is enhanced with whatever opportunity we can provide, whether it be a forum, at a public meeting, or uh, getting the information out to the press that something might be unfair. Uh, I think it goes hand in hand with civil service, which right now 
is certainly something that must be maintained and kept. It's something that has done a lot of cities and communities very well. It's civil service and collective bargaining go hand in hand. From my point of view, I'm in a position and will continue to make sure that collecting bargaining issues, no matter what particular union or what particular issues it's in, will go hand in hand with the, uh, the entire civil service practice as well. So I think I'm there for you and will continue to be for and have been for quite a while. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. So we're going to stay with um, something that uh, all, uh, Bill White mentioned, which is the Evergreen Clause. And we're going to start with Will Emba. So the Board of Aldermen, the current Board of Aldermen, have passed a resolution urging the mayor and his administration to change their policies on the negotiations over Evergreen Clauses. What would you do differently rather than just a resolution? Do you have any ideas rather than just urging the mayor to change his policy? Uh, thank you, Joe. I, like I said, I'm a pro-union guy. I love union. I came from union. Union actually made me who I am. You know, if I wasn't part of the union, you know, I would probably be living maybe in Walpole or somewhere else. You know, so I, would, I, would, I was actually making a decent living wage because of unions. So I really strongly support the Evergreen Clause and making sure that, you know, the unions are protected and to the strongest extent that they can go, just to make sure that, you know, like the people that are living in the community are secured, you know, because once they are thriving, the community too is thriving. So I don't see why there's a problem, you know, with that. I will just strongly make sure that I push it forward and make sure that, you know, it stays without you know, impacting the community, the workers that are doing the job. Thank you, Will. Mayor Jo? I thought you were, okay, so aside from what we've already done, what would I like to do further? Let, let me just, sorry, let me clarify why I'm asking that question is because many people have said to me a resolution isn't worth spit. Right. Exactly. I mean, that's what I said at answering the last question. It's a wish. It's a wish list. So um, it's very frustrating. It's extremely frustrating. And it angers the administration to no end when I repeat when we have these discussions that why is it that the school department and the school committee are doing the, are observing and recognizing the Evergreen Clause when I chaired the school committee before I uh, stepped down from that role. We were in negotiation, we were honoring the Evergreen Clause. I couldn't for the light, and that's the largest union in the city. Step forward to being an alderman and involved with my first negotiation, which we're really not involved when it just comes to us when it's completed, which I still can't understand. I could not for the life of me understand why the Evergreen Clause wasn't being recognized. And I'm still looking into that, and I've been making phone calls the last couple of weeks trying to figure out a way that why can't we make this be possible? So if we don't have the powers that we can force this upon the administration to do so, then although a resolve is worth spit, as Joe said, um, I say we do a resolve at each and every meeting and start the meeting with reading the whole resolution. And we read it be at the start of every meeting and keep it going and invite union to come before us and speak with us when the opportunity arises. And I, I don't you. want to stop because Thank I wish you, I could. Joe. Dennis Sullivan. Uh, thank you, Joe. Uh, not too long ago, I had the opportunity to go to a, a union retirement party for my union, the Mass Correction Officers Federated Union, and I have 30 years in, and I ran into a lot of guys that fought for the 20 years in, 50%, that uh, fought for a lot of language for five weeks after 19 and a half years. All that stuff's part of a contract. And, and just because we're at an impasse regarding wages, it should stay in place. The set of rules should be, should be good until a new contract comes up. Uh, that's language, that's stuff that previous members have fought for. You know, I'm hearing um, my, good, my good colleague, and I thought maybe every time put a resolution in, but maybe I saw Denise Pro here earlier, maybe have a, take a look at it and see if we can't pass a law at the state level that that should be included. Because not only does it protect union members, it protects the administration, the city, because rules have to be in place to operate. Just because we don't have a contract, we can work the d details out, but the evergreen clause has to stay in place. Thank you. Yeah. 
Thank you, Dennis. Kevin Tarpley. Thank you. Uh, we need to get a little uh, innovative and figure out how it could become part of some language like the charter, uh, where the mayor has to follow the rules and regulations of the charter, uh, to see if that is something that's possible to have that incorporated there. There are some great legal minds. Bill White, I consider a great legal mind uh, because uh, he's, he's been versed. He's someone that I've gone to in the past. We need to, as, as members of the board, we need to think about how can we innovatively put this in place where you have a strong mayor government where if he doesn't want to do it because he support union and city workers, he'll have to do it because it's the law. Thank you, Kevin. You know, if Bill White was such a great legal mind, he would have changed his name years ago, so it began with the letter A. <laughs> Just as long as you don't take it away from my time. In the past, there have been other candidates that did put A apostrophe Sorry, in front of their up. name. Sorry, time's right. up, Bill White. Thank you. No, the, the problem is, unlike the school committee, under state law, we are only the funding authorization part. So there's nothing you can do. Unfortunately, it's a function of state law. I, see, I don't know if Denise is still here, but... For things to change, it would have to be done at the state level to change uh, the powers of the Board of Aldermen and the Mayor with regard to funding uh, municipal contracts, pure and simple. Um, there are difficulties. There have been times when I've thought about maybe we don't approve the budget. Where else do you have a greater thing, right? But then if you don't approve the budget, and I've had discussions, what happens is they go by the prior year budget and you go one twelfth of that and then they do layoffs. And probably it will be like the school, I mean, if. You know, if you were the mayor and you thought the Board of Aldermen was trying to flex its muscles, you'd say, oh, we've got to have these layoffs now, and then you'd lay off like police, fire, DPW, schools and stuff. So th the budget really doesn't give us any avenues. Um, I think we really have to put our minds to it, whether, as, because as Dennis said, I mean, this is a common sense thing, and it just befuddles me as far as why there's the, the move afoot not to do it, because it does protect the city. So, I mean, I'm open to suggestions. I don't have all of the answers. I'm willing to sit down with folks here. If you have a way you think the Board of Aldermen can help on it, we're all open to that. Sometimes we have to sit down and put our minds together. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Jack Conley. The issue is probably going to be resolved in a number of ways. The one thing that can be done right away is to politicize it by making the issue aware to the everyday person. Thanks to social media, that message can get out. If there's a problem and there's an issue and getting it going, then local news media, the everyday citizen through Facebook, through Twitter. Making use of the social media to let people know that this is an important issue so that they can rattle the cages of not just us, but people in the administration. That's really gonna be help with the issue. As uh, Alderman White mentioned, yes, certainly it can be resolved maybe at the state level. That's going to take some time. But the issue is important right now. Use the leverage that you have with the budget by withholding something that the administration may want until there's, there's some time spent to deal with this issue and also to politicize it by letting enough people know about the issue in hand using the social media. So think about that. I think we're all willing to work with you. I'm happy to do it. Thank you, Jack. Stephanie Hirsch. So, so I would definitely support the union on this, and I want to say generally that I'm going to work on this if I'm elected as a full-time job. I, I tr I'm going to be as in independent as I can be. I will not take contributions from developers or realtors. I am going to dig into every detail, and there will be some tough dis discussions. I, 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 there, there will be budget constraints. I'm not going to agree on every matter, but when I do come in out to support somebody, I, I hope and believe that I will have um, a lot of weight in what I say because it will be data-based, it will be well-reasoned, and it's going to be, um, I, it won't be every issue that I advocate for, but it'll be the ones that I really believe in, and I think I will, there will be uh, influence in what I can say. Thank you, Stephanie. I'm going to go to in the next question, I believe, and then we're going to have Mary Jo Rossetti start off with that answer. The Somerville Fire Department went four years without a contract. The police went five years. And the SMEA, SMEA workers were forced to work for nearly seven years without a contract. What can you do as an alderman to ensure municipal workers are treated fairly, and the contracts are negotiated fairly, and in an expeditious matter, manner?
if I have this ability, which I'm taking notes as we're sitting here and I'm listening to the conversations of what I would like to do together with my colleagues at our next board meeting, but I, I, we do not routinely receive updates of negotiations. Uh, since I've been serving four years now, I could probably count on my hand how many times we've gone into executive session to receive updates on negotiation. So I think one thing that it, it's striking me right now is if it's within our privilege and right to do so, I would request more executive session meetings to honor the respect of negotiation and to keep it as it should be at the table with the members, but to bring this board up to date more often on where it exactly is at. Um, there are a lot of powers that I don't understand that we don't have until it comes to us at the very last hour, and this is definitely one of them. It's extremely frustrating. It's very frustrating for me, and I'm still trying to understand why we cannot be more involved. I, it's a weak answer, I realize it is, but I don't, you know, for the four years I've been serving, these, these union memberships have been without a contract, you're right. And do I like that? Absolutely not, and I don't understand that. So perhaps it is time for the Board of Aldermen to determine a way where we can get more involved in the negotiation Thank itself. you, Mary Jo. Dennis Sullivan. Thank you. It's, uh, it's unfortunate that both the fire and the police contracts had to go to the state board, the JLC, to get settled because we couldn't do it here with fair collective bargaining. It cost us money. We had, a, we had a higher outside council. And I was happy to vote to fund those contracts. Uh, there, there was talk that there may be some uh, reallocating of, of funds or, or, or possible layoffs. But, you know, I thought it was the right thing to do. They, the uh, union went to their to their arbitration at the state level, and, and we have to learn from that. And, and I think those are good examples of why to settle contracts before it gets to that level. So I will be an advocate for it. I will bring up that those two decisions, they went too, too long, and I think, it, quite frankly, it costs us probably a little bit more money going that route. So I will bring that up over and over to the administration in hopes to settle it at the table where it should be settled for our workers that are protecting our public safety. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Kevin Tarpley. Thank you. Uh, I concur with uh, Alderman Sullivan. Uh, what I would simply add to it is that I would be a, a, a pain in the uh, mayor's behind in terms of uh, getting him to get off the dime, to get us an answer, to keep us updated, uh, as uh, Ms. Rossetti said as well, uh, because that's, that's where we have some power. If you got to embarrass the mayor, and I've, as a, as a War II Alderman, I called out every department where I think that they filled the constituents that I was representing. I've called out the department heads that I thought was failing uh, our, our city workers. That's what I would do in terms of my role as alderman at large, is make sure that I'm uh, an advocate as well as making sure there's balance and uh, getting the information that we need to get out and get things moving. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Bill White. See, part of the, the problem is uh, there's an, not an equity, but the police and fire can go to the Joint Labor Management Com Commission, the JLMC, and get a de decision if the city doesn't bargain with them in a period of time, and they've been doing that. So that's almost a way to force the administration to bargain because they don't want to, the administration wouldn't want to keep going there because then they're at the risk of what the decision is going to be. And when those decisions have come down, we have voted to fund it. Um, but the problem is the SMEA doesn't have the benefit of that state law to be able to do that. So we really have to put our minds together so that when these contracts go out for that period of time, it really is unfair. Um, so I think the approach that we're all saying is we have to be more proactive and we have to think of ways that we can utilize not just resolutions but effective ways to prod the administration to move forward to make sure these contracts don't hang around so long because it's not been it's really not beneficial to the city and it's certainly not beneficial to the workers who you know working hard for us thank you bill jack, Con jack conley i mentioned a little bit before that the black and white issues get you elected. It's working in the gray area that get you reelected, and this is one of those issues where you must work with all the members of the unions here and their executive people to let some of us know that there are issues or something that we can be proactive with. We've got some leverage that we can work with in many budgetary fashions. 
uh, or appointments or these sort of things, but if you have to let us know how we can work with you. So the communications have to be both ways, not just dealing with the administration, but all of us are willing to support and work with you, but you gotta let us know what that issue is or what that thing might be so we can use whatever we can, whether it's an executive session or if it's a way of talking with somebody that might help the issue. You've gotta work with us to make sure that we're informed about what's going on. So I'm happy to do that. I'll pledge my support to do so, and I'm sure many of my colleagues will do the same. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Stephanie Hirsch. Uh, something that it, it needs to be taken care of, it's demoralizing, it's bad for everybody. The, uh, I don't know that this is a role that the Board of Aldermen can play, but I do think there needs to be a culture shift in the administration. Uh, I mean, I think that the kind of the administration t tends to um, like p um, hold out for the very like maximum optimal solution, and there has to be it has to be okay to get together and make compromises and make more kind of incremental changes, and that is kind of a pattern that we see you know, over the years in different situations, whether it be win or, or another, but this is another one where hold, holding out and continuing to push sounds like it's just making everybody unhappy. And so that would be what I would push for is kind of a culture change. Thank you, Stephanie. I just, be, Will, before you answer, I just wanna make one more announcement that if you are gonna be leaving, please make sure you leave your scorecards with one of the SLC folks. Sorry, Will. Will Amba. Yeah, thank you, Joe. I mean, this is really sad and unfair. The only thing I sit and think about is like, you know, how do we keep cutting deals with big developers, you know, while skimping on our workers, you know, and benefits and their pay? It's just, it's not just right. So the only thing we can do is also like, you know, other colleagues have said to support that is to, you know, demand an executive session and, you know, look for accountability. You cannot, you know, like be negotiating deals with big developer why people, you know, that are working for you, you know, are suffering with benefits and pay. So I I don't support that. Thanks. Thank you, Will. Let me just do a follow up question and maybe if you could hold the uh, response to thirty seconds. How's that? There seems to be contention between we keep saying the current administration. So let's face the fact, it's the Joe Curtitoni administration that the unions are having trouble with. Do you think that there's trouble with our strong mayoral mayorship? Not Joe himself, but do you think we should maybe think about a different model of how we govern this city? In 30 seconds, Joe. In 30 seconds. <laughs> Now you're going to see your candidates come forward. Which ones you want? The reason, yeah, the reason I'm asking that question is this. There has been discussion in this city for a long, long time about a strong mayoral form of government creates more problems than it solves. Would you like to see more power in the hands of the Board of Aldermen and less in the mayors? Let's start with Dennis. Uh, thank you, Joe. I was just reading today about Whistler and... They're trying to do their main streets. They're talking about the, uh, the old Worcester court up there, and uh, they have a town manager, and uh, Cambridge has a town manager. I'm not sure that that's the way to go. You know, I, I think that things can get done you know, with, with, the, with the current government we have. Boston has a strong mere form of government. I seem to think it works. I don't think it's perfect. If there was a perfect form, please let me know, but uh, I, I like a strong, more, a strong mere form of government. Thank you. Kevin Tarpley. Thank you. Uh, I, too, agree with a, a strong mayor, but what I think what we need now at this time uh, is a term limit on, on the mayor, term limits on the Board of Aldermen, because I think what tends to happen is people get comfortable, and they uh, know they got to run for office, and they do that, and they fool the people, and then they go back to their regular self, they'll come back and fool you again, and they'll come back uh, and be their regular self. Uh, and I used to be opposed to term limits. I said the term limits was the ballot box. But because, again, I think, and we've all said it here th today, that people are, are not informed, people don't want to participate. So I think if we as leaders simply stand up and say, yep, we're going to put term limits on ourselves, and if you sit out a term and then you come back and you get reelected, then you earned it. So uh, I agree, because I believe the people have to be served, not the politicians. Thanks, Kevin. Bill White. 
I guess you might like a strong mayor form of government depending on who the mayor is, but um, <laughs> I don't know. I've seriously thought about a city manager form of government because when you're in a city like Somerville and you're going through the potential of hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars of development, um, a lot of very thorny issues that are dealing with the fabric of society and what kind of community you're going to be, it might be best that you try to hire somebody who was a, you know, a top-notch expert in that area who would then be free of all political influences and then you would have a board of aldermen who would have a contract with the city manager so it isn't like you have an unelected person running the city. It would be done through the power of a board of aldermen or city council with their contract. So that would be the authority that they would have. It would sort of be like a, how the school committee and superintendent work. I'm not saying that I would definitely advocate that, but that's, you know, that's one of the solutions because unfortunately it's state law that gives a lot of the power to the mayor and we could tweak our city charter a few ways with the home rule petition, um, but that might not necessarily be the way. I love to explore ways to give the Board of Aldermen more power. I'm also looking at it. You know, there was a concern with holdover appointments. I just put in a proposed ordinance where if the mayor, if there's a holdover um, appointee and the mayor hasn't submitted the name to the Board of Alden within a certain period of time, then it becomes vacant. Thank so you, Bill. Way, so that's an example. Thank, Thank you, you, Joe. Thank you. <laughs> He's punishing me. He thinks I'm tired and I'm not going to hear the bell. Jack Conley. Joe, you know, I, it is a political science major in college, you can look at a number of things. Worcester's going through some major headaches now with their type of government. Cambridge is having their share of difficulties with the Plan E form. What I think makes sense is look back in history. During the late 60s, the city was in turmoil. S. Lester Ralph came along and with some of the United Neighborhoods, the whole culture of Somerville began to change. In 1979, when Tom August was mayor, the city was started going downhill again. A guy by the name of Gene Brun showed up and continued moving the things forward. So it all depends who is in that chief executive chair and, and what he decides to, or she decides to do. Surround yourself with good people and get the hell out of the way. Let them do the job. Let the unions do what they know how to do. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. <laughs> Stephanie Hirsch. Uh, I I think I like the strong mayor form, but if I were to consider another, it w I think the city manager does have some benefits. Um, um, but you know, I think we've had just a tremendous period of, of stability and leadership. Um, Bruin, Capuano, and I think Curtitonia have done a lot of great stuff for the city. And we will go into a period when, when Mayor Joe leaves, we will go into a period of transition. And I don't know if we'll be better off or worse off, but it'll definitely be a period of growth for the city. And um, so we'll have to see what happens. I, I would like to see the boards and commissions, the powerful ones, reform the way the appointment process works. Um, but I do think if we went to city manager, it would be kind of um, less interesting in terms of reading the local newspapers. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, so I'm really op opposed to the mayoral system that we currently have right now. Like, I feel like the mayor has too much power so it needs to be democratic. Even most of the people on the planning board should actually be elected, not appointed. Because look at what just recently happened to Free. You know, the community came out, all the elected offi officials that are sitting right here came out in opposition, and yet it passes. So that already says a lot about the system. So there's a lot of you know uh, things that we can do to optimize the system, to make it more democratic, more transparent. You know that is a government that will work for the interests of the people, not special interests. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Mary Jo. This is the first time I've been asked this question ever in in, in many um, meetings and with neighborhoods from all parts of all across our city. This conversation has never been brought forward ever. So, um, you know what? I honestly don't know. And what I do know is that I value the opinion of, of the people in the community. And what I would do is ask, you know, for a couple of forums where we had this type of dialogue and see what the people want. I'm not sure. I, you know, there are two ways to look at it. But what I would do is work through, through the Mass Municipal Association, of which we pay our dues to be members of 
and speak to the communities that do have that form of government and speak to others that don't and try to weigh both sides and then bring the dialogue to, to the table with the community. And then I, then I could make my decision. Thank you, Mayor Joe. Let's go into another question. Also has to do with part of the collective bargaining and it's about health care benefits. So the Su Somerville has sought to balance its budget by shifting health care costs on the backs of the city workers and retirees. If you are opposed to further cuts in health care for city employees and retirees, do you have a way of avoiding it? Let's start with Kevin Tarpley. Thank you. Uh, let me first say, when I was on the Board of Aldermen, I tried to address this very issue. Folks who had left, and I, and I knew because of the uh, financial situation, uh, there was going to be re some resistance. Folks who left the job due to an injury, and I think Mary Broom talked about some of those people back in 1980. I tried to get those folks a COLA, 3%. No support on the board for that, okay? No support on the board. So it is uh, my position that we figure out a way that we are going to uh, be able to support individuals who work for the city, who have gone out on retirement, and uh, are in need of a COLA increase to, so that they can continue to pay for their health care. And in this process, in the meantime, we try to figure out a way where we can have this financed by future development because Somerville's not done. And I think we need to begin to look at the city where there's going to be some ongoing development that's going to create some revenue that can be set aside to support health care for our city workers. Thank you, Kevin. Bill White. Let's see, my recollection is what caused the, the real shift was when the city went into the GIC. Now, having gone into the GIC, I, I don't believe there's anything further that this Board of Alden would do in any way to further shift any additional burdens onto the uh, city employees from our end. So the only other way I guess it would come about would be through the collective bargaining agreement and if there was um, pressure put on through the administration to further reduce um, the benefits that workers would receive in collective bargaining negotiations, then that would be something, especially if we follow up in um, our executive session meetings that definitely, I think as a board, we would um, definitely voice opposition on because I don't think uh, there should be any further balancing of the budget, as I said, on the backs of workers, and especially if you're re reducing benefits. So any, any areas that would come to the Board of Aldermen that would require approval to cut benefits, I don't see any of us here supporting that. Thank you, Bill. Jack Conley. I agree with uh, Bill White that uh, and, uh, certainly as one member, that's not something I could possibly support, but uh, the big question obviously comes down to health care costs, not just for us here in the city, but around the country, and so us maintaining that whole collective bargain agreement, as I mentioned earlier, it's going to be up to all the various uh, labor unions here to make sure that we know just what the issues are so that we can help with what we can do the state may only allow us to go a certain direction, but we can certainly do an awful lot more collectively working with you in your bargaining situation. So I think it's a little more cooperation with some of us who can get the ear of those people in the administration about what's important to you and what's important to your families. So I'm on board. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Stephanie Hirsch. Uh, I think the question is partly how do you fund more revenue for the city um, as people talk about often commercial development is really important and to do that I think we need um, permit ready sites and to have be um, a, a place where um, developers do want to come so that's something that I think we have to keep working on and, and, and including passing the citywide zoning but to go back to, to balancing everything so I've been door knocking, I've talked to about 2,000 different households now, and the list of issues that people are worried about, it is so long. So in East Somerville, I would say 80% of households talk about rats, and like all these long stories about rats. People talk about family members dying of opioids. The West Branch Library is, the, you know, paint is falling off the wall. People want athletic fields. People want um, after school programming. It is going to have to be a discussion where we talk about how to spend resources. 
And to say it's easy is not realistic. Thank you, Stephanie. Will? Yeah, so most of the questions usually even relate to my story. As I came here on a permanent resident living in Somerville, the first thing I applied for without a job was you know, for mass health. And I was rejected because they said I wasn't uh, below 19 and I didn't have a dependent. So healthcare is something that's, that's I think it's a fundamental human you know, need, some basic need that people should be able to afford. So having gone through that, you know, living in a community, you know, you don't have a job, you don't even have health insurance. If anything happens to you, you're just by yourself. So I think that's ridiculous. So I will not support cutting benefits for any municipal employee. Thank, Thank you. you, Will. Mary Jo? Thank you. I, I, nor I would support any, any increase in cost of benefit. If that, I forget the actual question at this point, but... Uh, <laughs> Mary Jo, I'm not yeah. going to embarrass you because I forgot the question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if it's about, go ahead, if you could repeat it just so I make I sure will. I'm focusing correctly. I will. Jack, you want to tell me what the question was about? Health care. I knew it was health care, but Thank I did. I did. Much. How to increase revenues for the offset of, of I increase. have to apologize. I was already on to the next question because I'm thinking about the timing. Offsetting the amount, right. yes, okay. We're so, balancing the budget on yeah. the backs of the union. Okay. Yep. So that I that I can speak to is the recent budget that we just passed and, and um, orders that I had put in. This past year, I'm proud of the fact that I advocated to re reduce the principal of the $50 million bond for the Green Line extension. That was $50 million unexpected bill on the shoulders of all of us here. So yeah, that was going to impact different sections of the budget, sure it will. The sale of the Powder House School, which had been vacant for greater than 10 years, finally was sold and the money was sitting and I urged and pushed for that money to be put towards the uh, principal on the Green Line budget. I was told it couldn't be done, the state wouldn't allow it. I said, well, let's remind the state this, uh, the $50 million was the first time a community was ever put on, had that on their shoulders, and they agreed, and boom, the $2 million now came off the principle of the Green Line extension. I'll be very quick, but I also put in an order, the pilot agreement with Tufts University expires this year. I put in a board order last week that the Board of Aldermen be at the table for the renegotiation of a new pilot, which will be bigger than $200,000 if I can be there. Thank you, Mary Jo. Dennis Sullivan. Hey, thank you, Joe. And uh, today, if you read the paper, Congress is talking about health care. Since I've been in office approximately 20 years, health care is more than quadruple the cost. Uh, the city went into the GIC saving $10 million. If I had, the answer lies in, in reining in that cost nationally. Uh, it was costing us, before we went into the GIC, three average homes in taxpayers' dollars for one family plan. Uh, they, they sought, the administration sought a vote regarding going into the GIC, he did it without a vote. The town of Attleboro and North Attleboro did it without a vote of the Board of Aldermen. I didn't support that because our retirees, most of them are making under $30,000. People are living longer. They can't afford an increase. But I don't have the answer on reining in health care costs. My mother has cancer right now. Uh, she's in hospice. And uh, she's paying a lot of money. So... Uh, you know, I don't have the answer, but it lies in reining in the cost. I think it's a, a congressional. We can raise the COLA, like my like brother Topley said, but we just raised the amount to fourteen thousand dollars up, a thousand dollars at two percent. That's two hundred and eighty dollars a year. That's it's not going to cut it. Our retirees are hurting, and we should be doing everything we can to help them. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. <laughs> Kevin Topley, you're going to get the next question, and we are going to be wrapping up very very shortly. So I'm going to ask you. Uh, this goes into the whole health care system, and as a retiree, it's one of the most important questions you can answer tonight. Would you support a cap on the retiree health care splits? Let's start with Kevin. Absolutely. Okay. Bill White. Yes. Jack? Yes. We're taking a vote here. The yes. vote of the future Board of Aldermen. Yes. Stephanie Hirsch. Aye. Will Emba. Yes. Mary Joe Rossetti. Aye, absolutely. Yes. And Dennis Sullivan. Yes. 
Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. These are the candidates for Alderman at Large in the city of Somerville. Jack Conley, Stephanie Hirsch, Will Emba, Mary Jo Rossetti, Dennis Sullivan, Kevin Tarpley, and Bill White.